Hello and welcome back to our study of the Dhammapada. Today we continue with verse 226, which reads as follows. Sada jagaramana nang ohora tanusiki nang nibanang adimutta nang chanti asava which means for those who are always awake training both day and night in, for those intent on Nibbana the defilements of the mind come to an end this verse was taught in response to a discussion between the Buddha and a slave woman named Puna, a servant woman or slave, I guess I'm not quite sure how you should translate it. I don't know that there were, I guess there were slaves at that time, it was more of a in, indentured servitude perhaps or now, there was definitely class problems and so on. Low class people were, um, they, they turned themselves over as servants and I don't know how it worked anyway. It wasn't a perfect society by any means. Um, but this woman was assigned to a great amount of work. Uh, there was a festival perhaps, I don't know. She was assigned to grind up rice into flour or some sort of rice based work and so she had to work late into the night and it was tiresome and late at night in Rajagaha Rajagaha is a city that is surrounded by mountains so late at night while she was working she looked over and she saw up on the mountain and uh, Gijakuta, Vulture's Peak Lights along the tra traveling along the path uh, up and down the mountain, and it was the monks after listening to the Buddha teach or listening to whoever was teaching that day late at night, they would return back to their uh, their kuti or return back to their tent or the tree perhaps that they were staying under. And they had a light to go along the way. And she thought, but she didn't know this. And she thought to herself, wow, I wonder why they're up so late. And I'm up because I have all this work to do. It must be some, some sickness or something wrong. It must be something wrong. I wonder why they're up so late. And thought nothing more of it. And then in the morning... She got together some of the, the, the rice dust that was left over from her work and took it up in her hand, poured some water over it and made it into a rice paddy and uh, put it in the stove and in the charcoal to heat it and prepared her meal that way and then walked out of her place of residence and Maybe it was going to work, I don't know. And she met the Buddha. And the Buddha was going on alms round, and she thought to herself, I have this, this offering I could give this to this monk who appears to be very, very much worth uh, supporting. And I could do that, and that would be a great thing for me to do, but there's no way he'd accept it. And the Buddha stopped and looked at her, and so she... She held out the this coarse, you know, rice dust cake. You know, just the, really the worst food, lowest grade food you could you could make. And the Buddha held out his bowl. She put the food in her in his bowl and thought to herself, "Well, he's accepted it out of kindness to me. That's that's very kind of him to to accept my offering. But there's no way he's going to eat it." He'll give it to someone else And so she followed along behind him 
and watched and the Buddha went to a tree, stopped under the tree, sat down and started eating her, her rice cake. And so she went up to him and she sat down and waited for him to finish. And they got to talking and she remarked to him, she said, so I'm up, I'm up late at night because of all the work and all the, the duress I'm under to get this work completed. What's what's up with you? you know, there must be something wrong with you, with the monks that they're up so late. And the Buddha said, "Well, it's true that you're up because of your stre the stress that you're under, but my students they are up all night because that's their that's the work that they are doing because they are intent upon freeing themselves from suffering." And he taught this verse. So I think what this story reminds us, or, or teaches us, the lesson it has. Well, it, it's in the juxtaposition between the, the worldly exertion and the way of life of a Buddhist meditator. It reminds us that meditation isn't just a hobby. I think uh, a lot of Buddhists, of course, a lot of people who practice Buddhist meditation never realize the the potential uh, for you know, practicing day and night, you know, training themselves not only as a as a hobby or as a sort of a side exercise but as a truly as a way of life as an as a way of exerting themselves you know we th we think of meditation differently from work that we do or ambitions that we have um, life goals and a life's work it's rare to find someone who thinks of buddhism or buddhist meditation as a life work and so the idea of staying awake all day and all night and, and doing something like meditating all day and all night seems crazy. I've suggested that to to some people and they just thought it was the, the most crazy thing to suggest that one might stay up all night meditating. And yet we do stay up all night for other reasons. We'll stay up all night partying or uh, studying, working. We'll even stay up all night suffering <laughs> if we're if we're an insomniac or if we have some grievance. You know? People who have lost loved ones might stay up all night. So we stay up all night for all sorts of different reasons. We pull an all nighter for for our work. And so the the idea that meditation practice, practice of Buddhism, training in the Buddhist teaching should be similar is an important idea that we should understand and, and appreciate. Sada Jagaramananam for those who are awake always. It really is a an ideal that we strive for uh, in our practice to get to the point where we can be awake day and night, where we can be mindful. Because of course sleep is sleep is a it's a way of resetting the mind. And if your mind is engaged in activities that sully it, that that increase its stress and tension and and wind it up, then sleep is a way of coming back to an ordinary and normal state, and so it feels quite relieving, and so we really like sleep. But for a meditator it's quite the opposite. Meditation is a means of unwinding, it's a means of untying, winding down the mind. And, and sleep actually winds it back up because all of our ordinary and, and familiar habits um, you know, reassert themselves through dreams and through just through the relaxed state of sleep. And so we find the progress we've gained is often reset. And so practicing day and night, is, because of the nature of meditation, is actually 
a better thing for the mind and for the body even than sleep. It can be. That's, I think, the, the, the lesson of the story, that we should treat meditation as something, as a life's work. Something we have to put our whole heart in. If you really want to gain results, it's something you have to decide is going to be a, a part of your life, not just a hobby or not just an escape, but something that you take as a training. And so that's what the verse starts to teach. The, the, the verse has four, four parts. The first is in relation to being always awake. The second is in regards to the training, training day and night. So the Buddha taught three types of training, or three aspect, three parts to the training. Uh, the first one is sila, this means ethical behavior. Uh, the second is samadhi, which means focus or concentration. And the third is panya, which means wisdom. And there's a sense that the first leads to the second, the second leads to the third, but also a sense that this is the three aspects of our training. When we train, when we practice, Mindfulness, we're training in all three. So sila, the first one, ethics, it refers, of course, to not breaking precepts. So we should always be uh, keeping ethical precepts that we don't do this and we don't do that, not just sometimes, not just when it's convenient. I won't kill when it's convenient, but when there are mosquitoes, well, I'll take a break from that. You, know, you can't do that. Taking a break is... Especially for ethics, it, it, it misses the point of ethics because it's not so much about the body as it is about what it does for your mind. It helps you focus. And if you're only ethical when it's convenient, you're not really ethical at all. You're not changing the mind in any appreciable degree. But when you are ethical, when you do guard the mind, or guard the body and, and speech with the mind, then it does change, it does focus your mind, because the, the avenues by which the mind would get lost and get sidetracked are shut off. And so it involves not just keeping precepts, but also guarding our behavior. When you walk, ethical walking means being with the walking, you know, being objective as you walk. Ethical speaking means being present when you speak, being aware of what you're saying and being aware of the emotions, guarding the mind as it approaches the, the physical door and the verbal door. The second training, samadhi, often is translated as concentration, but focus maybe makes more sense because it's about focusing for not just focusing in, but also coming into focus. As you're more ethical, your mind will start to right itself. Samadhi has a, a meaning etymologically of, of balance, I think. It's like, like the word same, it's like a, a balance. When you're not, when you're not un, uncentered or unfocused, when you get to the point where everything starts to settle. Right? This is why... Tranquility meditation is such a useful base for practice because it settles the mind. But mindfulness and mindfulness of uh, experience drives straight to the point because it straightens out our crookedness. It straightens out all the disruptions. It settles all of our disruptions, unties all the knots in the mind. Because normally when we experience, for example, pain or, or bad memories or loud noises, we react, you know, we're, we're tied to them, we're caught up by them. And this disturbs the mind, it, it, it unfocuses our, our mind. So as we become more mindful, our mind focuses and stabilizes. And that's necessary in order to see clearly, right? But just like with a camera, in order to... See, you have to focus it just like um, a, a pool of water if you, or a pot of water. If you, if you stir it up or if it's boiling or something, you, know, you can't see until everything settles to the bottom. And once it settles, then you can see what's in. Oh, this, 
in tide pools when the when the ocean tide comes in it gets can get muddy but then when it settles then you can see so when the mind is r riled up when the mind is disturbed when the mind is caught up by all the emotions and att attachments and reactions that are a part of our ordinary non-meditative life we can't see anything clearly and so the just as the first leads to the second the second leads to the third which is panya panya meaning wisdom and wisdom is in buddhism not very similar to what we normally think of as wisdom in in non-meditative circles when we talk about wisdom we think of something intellectual but wisdom really means becoming more familiar with reality it's not about studying intellectually anything that we might call reality it's about studying firsthand so that we become more familiar what does that mean it means becoming more familiar with pain because familiarity removes or at least reduces step by step our reactivity you know something that is so familiar to us doesn't have the same power over us as, as something that we are we we are constantly just reacting to you know trying to avoid shying away from and so by focusing on pain by focusing on the bad memories by focusing on the sound that disturbs us we become more familiar with it we may become more familiar with our reactions And we're as a result able to see the reactions that are positive and beneficial And those that are unbeneficial We're able to see firsthand what it is that's causing us stress and suffering And as it becomes more familiar we become wiser It means we know more clearly We, we understand more clearly the results of our of our behaviors, the results of our reactions, and so as a result, we change. You know, wisdom is about change, really. The process of acquiring wisdom is about abandoning all the wrong behaviors, all the misunderstandings, all the uh, self harming uh, tendencies that we have. Ohora tanusikinam. Ohora ta. Ohora. Oho is, is day. Arata is night. Ohora tanusikinam. Nibbana nga Intent on nibbana. This then refers to the goal. So when you say we train, we train, when you talk about meditation as a training, one of the bi biggest challenges to doing that is understanding why you might be doing that. Right? We understand that, that we would party all night because of the pleasure, you know, the excitement. We understand that we would study all night because of the grades that we might get, because of you know, the eventual job that we might get. We work all night because of the money, the success, the results that we can see, tangible results. And uh, Often it's quite daunting or, or challenging for meditators to find reason to commit themselves to meditation, to see the benefits of the meditation, which is kind of curious because the benefits are very similar to any other type of training or work that you might undertake. You know, they're very much related to the actual nature of the work. If you, um, if you study all night, you know, you know more about the subject. If you uh, work in a factory all night, you get factory, uh, factory products. If you party all night, well, you get a hangover. But no, you also get uh, the excitement and you know, the pleasure. I think with meditation we often look too far. You know, we, we 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 think of results as being some spiritual, magical, mystical, um, high and 
airy fairy. I don't know. Uh, that some like like up in the up in the sky. Sort of uh, like there will be a big sign. You've made it or something. When in fact meditation is just a training. Nibbana. When we talk about nibbana, it's often thought of as this very special thing that 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 you would really just you know be like walking into a. A capital city or a, a kingdom or, or walking into heaven It would be like arriving at the pearly gates of heaven Or something But Nibbana is the result of training When you train yourself, what happens? You become trained When you see clearly When you, when you observe When you cleanse the mind Clear off the, the lens of perception you see more clearly. What do you get? You get clarity. So nibbana is is more of a function of the mind than anything. Nibbana means release or or freedom. It often it literally means extinguishing, extinguishing, putting out the fires. So it's re directly related to our observation and and appreciation and. Cultivation of understanding of the fires. The fire is what? The, the fire is in the mind. The fire of greed, the fire of anger, the fire of delusion. Nibbana is not some thing that we attain, something that we get to if we travel long and far. Because you, you, thinking of it that way, as a place that you might get to, the place has nothing to do with the journey. Right, and so when we think like that, we 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 have no idea that we're getting close to the journey, right? Close to the destination. When someone is driving a car, you suppose you're driving to a city. You know, until you get to the outskirts of the city, you don't know whether you're going the right way, and that's often I think how meditators feel, because they separate the journey from the destination, and it's not like that. When you lift weights. You're not trying to move the weights somewhere So that by the end you look and you say Boy, those weights got all the way over there Or all the way up there I kept lifting them until they got to heaven Absolutely not You lift the weights and lift the weights And you turn around and you say They're still where they started They haven't moved at all It's kind of like that Which is absurd, of course Because you're not lifting weights to move them You're lifting weights to strengthen the body and likewise, you're lifting, you're, you're, you're cultivating the, you're exerting the mind in order to strengthen it and to polish and to cleanse it. You clean, you, when you, when you clean the house, nothing magical happens, you just end up with a cleaner house. You know? When you cleanse the mind, there's nothing magical that happens. Often meditators are Excited by sights, they'll see bright lights or colors or pictures Maybe they'll hear sounds Maybe they'll feel bliss or rapture and they'll think, well, maybe that's it And none of those are it What's it is a clarity of mind The mind becomes more clear Sees things closer to as they really are The understanding of the thing, that the things that we, f we cling to Are not worth clinging to that which we feel is permanent, stable, lasting is actually not. So the letting go of the things that we cling to, that which we think of as satisfying, this will satisfy me, we find out it's not. And just a general realization that there's nothing worth, there's nothing satisfying. Those things that we crave are not, not actually going to satisfy us. There's no benefit in striving for them and craving for them. Uh, that the things that we think of as me and mine under my control are not me nor mine nor under my control. All of which leads us to let go. Leads us to free ourselves from our attachments, from our stress, from, from our suffering. Atanga chanti asava. So someone who trains and who realizes, who, who, who frees themselves. They will be free from all defilements of the mind. That's really the goal. If you want to ask whether you've made progress, you just have to ask, how's your mind doing? Is your mind seeing more clearly? Try and get a sense of 
what it is that you're actually doing when you say to yourself pain pain what what is it what is what are you doing no. and that might not be clear in the beginning but it should be fairly clear as you go that what you're doing is reminding yourself and you're you're cultivating this capacity to remember things as they are to see pain as pain in order to say pain you have to know that it's pain which we think well of course i know it's pain but you don't we do for a second and then we're gone when you say to yourself pain you're cultivating the the perspective that pain is pain rather than that's a problem i have to fix it what am i going to do take some medicine or get a massage or something so it's a change and it cultivates objectivity and and a familiarity because it brings you actually closer to the experience and keeps you with the experience so you ask you so you see you ask yourself what am i doing what is it doing and you see that that's what it's doing then you can only guess that without doubt the results will be similar okay i'm i'm seeing things more clearly as they are i'm more f becoming more familiar with things i'm going to have a better perspective of things and you can look there you can see there am i less reactive towards these things am i um more uh objective about my experience more peaceful in my interactions with things that's where you see results of course the the thrust of the verse and the story is that really the most um, likely way of of attaining any real results is again to te to treat buddhist practice as a life goal not as a hobby not as something you do when it's convenient but something that you engage in day and night. Sada jagaramana for those who are always awake. So that's the Dhammapada for today. Thank you all for listening.